Hello, and welcome to the third episode of MKE Arts Live. We are here tonight at Mayad in the Frederick Layton Gallery. And for our first performance, we are going to have Racine Symphony Orchestra. Another round of applause for the Racine Symphony Orchestra. All right. That was
stars uh, Nancy Mayo and Albertosic playing Bach's Concerto for Two Violins in D minor. Uh, they have a concert this Saturday coming up, or sorry, next Saturday, as well as a fundraiser coming up on November 17th. You can go to their website, Racine Symphony Orchestra, or sorry, RacineSymphony.org to learn more. My name is Adam Carr. Welcome to MKE Arts Live. Uh, as you may be able to tell, we are at the Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design, and we are here for two very special reasons. One is because our theme today is the art of art. Uh, Myad, as you may know, is a hub, is a hive of bustling creativity, so that's why we're here at Myad. Also, tomorrow is gallery night, and they will be opening a show around the corner in the Brooks Stevens Gallery um, on the chair. It's named Chair 5. Um, and we're right now in the Frederick, Frederick Layton Gallery, and there's a show of printmaking up named Fantastic that you should come check out. Uh, and I should note that MKE, MKE Arts Live is a show made possible by the United Performing Arts Fund. So, our guest today, Susan. Yes. Welcome. Susan Fate is from Renaissance Theater Works. She is the artistic director there, yes. as well as one of the co-founders. Yes. And to kick us off, Milwaukee is blessed to have a number of really high quality theater groups, and they all do things a slightly different way. Tell me about kind of the signature of Renaissance, of Renaissance. Theater Works. Renaissance was founded 25 years ago, and a significant part of our mission is providing opportunities for women. Uh, there's still a great disparity in the performing arts um, for women, and we promote women in all kinds of right, ways in theater, actors, directors, and in less traditional roles, in lighting designers and stage managers, and just about everything. Cool. So you are entering right now your 25th season. Yes. Uh, it actually starts tomorrow, and we'll yeah. get to that in a moment. Yeah. But can you walk us back to your very first production? Sure. Our very first production was A Different Moon by Ara Watson. And we were really fortunate to produce that in collaboration with Theater X. And Theater X had, that was their first season, talk about serendipity, of um, Theater X Presents Theater's Women. And they called Marie Kohler, uh, one of the other Renaissance co-founders, and said, hey, we're doing this thing. Would you like to be involved? which was great because we would still be in her kitchen otherwise talking okay. about it. So we decided to do this play, and I think you and I were talking about this a little bit the other day. You're really better off not knowing what you don't know because you would be too, well, you would just be smarter and you wouldn't do it, you know? Yeah. So we didn't, there were so many things we didn't know and we just, oh, we're, we're just doing it. I directed, Marie was in it, Raylene was in it, Jennifer stage managed, um, and Michelle uh, Treban, our other co-founder, wrote our timeline and did a budget, which we sorely needed. And something else I thought about, uh, after I talked to you about opening night, I was really pregnant. And we opened, and, and the costumer, because no one got paid, you know, the costumer, didn't make her bus, didn't catch her bus, and so she had all the costumes. It was set in the Korean War. It's five <laughs> minutes to opening of our first show, and the costumes aren't there. Yeah. So they asked me, well, what, you know, what should we do? And I said, well, I'm going into labor, so <laughs> you guys do whatever you want. <laughs> but she showed up, and it was great, and it, you know, and you guys, and it all turned and out you well. you birthed, birthed Renaissance. Yeah. That happened. Yeah. That's what came... So, yeah. um, so fast forwarding a little bit, you guys within five years were doing a full season. Yes. So you got your legs under mm -hmm. you, and you've done, and you're entering your 25th season now. What have been some of the biggest challenges and highlights for you in this process of kind of the, the maturation of Renaissance? Um, some of the biggest challenges have been financial and trying to do. We we've been blessed with many great idea people in our career and trying to make those ideas happen within the constraints of a nonprofit budget. Um, and, but I think we've, we've prevailed when we could and when we couldn't do it up to our standards, we chose something else. Sure. So, 
So you guys are 25 years in as you're looking. Can I just say to you, I was it. 12 when we started. <laughs> you said 25 so many times. I'm like, just sorry let's, about that. let's set this up. No, I'm sorry. I'm teasing. Well, as you look forward to your next mm -hmm. set of years mm -hmm. in determined amount of the future of Renaissance, what are the projects you're invested in now to kind of look forward to? Um, well, we want to continue to do the great theater that we're doing and employ more artists and pay them better than we're paying them now. Pay, you know, um, and we have a few key projects that we're doing right now. One is Brink, which is in our fourth season. And part of what women playwrights don't have um, a lot in our society is a place to workshop, to bring their work to the next level. So Brink is our um, new play development workshop. And we would like to. Um, grow that and, and be able to bring more women playwrights in. And so far, it's been really successful. And I think it could do a lot more for the community. Our other, um, we, just, we just had our first class on Saturday. I'm so excited about our Fran Bauer Young Critics Project, which um, teaches young women in high school about the art of theater criticism. Uh, we're in, in our country, we're in sore need of women and women of color to become art critics so that all artists get to be critiqued by someone that looks like them. So we're really excited about that. And there was one, oh, and Groundworks, yeah. So as most of you know, I'm sure that there's a great brain drain with artists and with all kinds of things in Milwaukee that people go to school here and then leave because they don't have opportunities. Well, we started Groundworks last year as a way to employ some of Milwaukee's hottest young talent. And it's a, um, it's three days in December. We're, uh, this year's production is Bliss and directed by a brilliant woman named Nabra Nelson. So we're really excited about that. So you're remarkably composed right now because I am. we are moments away from the premiere. Oh my God. From your opening yeah. night tomorrow. So thank you for even I've being here. I've left my at body. All. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So taking, getting out of the vice grip yeah. of the show starting I tomorrow. I think they're happy I'm gone. So tell, us, <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit about what's happening tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow night is our preview for the play uh, Sex with Strangers by Laura Eason. And it um, is one of the hottest shows in the United States right now. It, uh, one of the most produced plays last year. It's a romantic, I think it's a comedy. Other people don't agree with me. But it's a May and December romance um, where the woman is December for change. And it's a story about different generations and how they both view their art. They're both professional writers. Yeah, right. um, and it's also really hot. Really hot? Yeah, all really right. hot. So uh, more from Susan in a moment. Right now, we're all going to get up and take a field trip through the magic of video production. Backstage, uh, this, is a, this is a treat. I got to hang out a little bit behind the scenes at the Milwaukee Repertory Theater in their prop shop, which is one of the most amazing places I've ever been. So right now, we're going to join Jim Guy in a video giving us a tour of the Reps Prop Shop. Everything that they eat, drink, read, smoke, burn, break, shoot, and the matches that they light the stuff up with, all that stuff is the props. My name is Jim Guy. I am in my 20th season as Properties Still Director at the Milwaukee Repertory Theater. My bio when I worked at a theater that had a prop person's bio in it, uh, the last line in my bio was always, props is his life. If you build a house from the ground up, so all you got is a raw house, you got floors, windows, doors, ceilings, that's it. Um, that's the set, that is the structure within which the play takes place. Everything that goes into that space that makes it your house at this time under these circumstances and tells your story and the story of the world around you, that's the props. I am well aware of the fact that aside from the people who work in this room with me, nobody's paying to see the furniture. They're paying to see a whole performance and our job is to help the actors make that whole performance. This is where the rest of our world starts. 
Tables with corners, tables without corners. And our empty frames and tabletops over there. And stools tall on the bottom, stools short and shorter on the top. Small appliances, uh, garden and patio furniture, institutional furniture and office furniture, beverage service, and then over to personal grooming, health and beauty. I care about the details. The guys who work with me care about the details. Designers and actors love that. And this prop department is known for fine detail. Uh, the actors who come here from other cities go back spreading the news that Milwaukee Rep has one of the most amazing detail-oriented prop departments in the country, and I, I stand by that. All right. So now, we've been joined by some panelists. Uh, we have Eric Vogel from Myad, an assistant professor of interior architecture and design. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have Jim Guy, who you all just saw on the screen. <laughs> Jim is the prop master at the Milwaukee Repertory Theater. Props master, I believe. Properties director. Properties director, sorry. And then Malkia Stampley, who is an actress, director, producer, extraordinaire, and co-founder of the Milwaukee, uh, the Bronzeville Arts Ensemble. Yes. All right, round of applause for all of them. Yeah. So this is an incredible foursome of people that we've had join us. And my first question to you all, you're all established in your field. You've kind of, you've landed, you've arrived. What advice would you give to someone who is just getting started? So to your fledgling creative, mm. what would you give them briefly as mm. a piece of advice? Let's go first. I'll start. All right. Um, I, I believe that um, relationships are the foundation um, of an artist's career. So making sure that your relationships are strong with whoever it is, um, everything is a big deal. So it's never, oh, I'm just doing this little project or this small audition. And my last piece of advice is to be open um, and be willing to adapt whatever your dream or goal is for your career. Mm. Yeah, I echo that. <laughs> I would say listen closely, feel deeply, think carefully and expansively, and respond with empathy. Because there's a sense that, well, that's easier said than done, mm -hmm. right? Um, we actually teach something called the six scales here at Mayad to our students. And it's in, very influenced by Errol Saarinen, the great architect designer, who always said, you know, think one scale up and one scale down from mm -hmm. the thing that you're making. We actually say, think two scales up and two scales down. So from architecture, that would be, don't forget the site and the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And for the room, don't forget the body and the detail. Mm -hmm. And that expansiveness, I think, allows students to both open and connect in a really positive way. Mm -hmm. Speaking strictly as a prop person, um, you can never stop learning. There is no yeah. way you can ever know everything that right. you need to know mm -hmm. to be a good prop person. But you've got to learn how to find out and how to keep building your base of knowledge and spreading that knowledge so that you're ready when the questions come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would say trust your instincts. Mm. Don't spend a second listening to people, and there will be tons of them that will tell you that it can't be done mm. and that you can't do it. Yeah. You are smarter and better than you realize. Surround yourself with positive, hardworking people and just go do it. Mm. All right, thank you guys. I feel ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but my motto is, how hard can it be? So <laughs> absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Who cares about practicality? <laughs> so all of you are here because you help birth and then nurture creative ideas. And uh, really, this is a more poetic way of asking, how do you do that? What mm. is it that each of you do so our audience can get to know a little bit of your creative professional practice more? Mm. Well, I'll jump in. I mean, I, I have a very mixed background. So I, I studied uh, photography and sculpture, then installation art. The scale kept getting bigger. Uh, I found myself in architecture school, then working for Frank Gehry and practicing architecture for many years. Um, I actually graduated with a degree in architectural history. So I find now, as I'm teaching more, I'm starting to write more. Um, I published a book with uh, John Eastberg, my co-author, three years ago on the 19th century history of, uh, cultural history of Milwaukee, mm -hmm. focused on Frederick Layton and his world. Mm -hmm. um, I'm working on a book now called Milwaukee Moderns, uh, which looks at innovators in the 20th century and the buildings they helped put together. For me, 
breadth has so much to do with it. Um, and I, I like to think horizontally across disciplines and then choose one spot and focus deeply and go the other direction, go vertically. And I think that combination, actually sort of borrowed from the painter Gerhard Richter who said, why should I just be a realist painter? I want to paint abstractly. Oh, and then by the way, while I'm painting abstractly, I also want to be a realist. And so he denied people's categories of what a painter should be. So I said, well, why can't I be a historian and an author at the same time as I'm teaching architecture and thinking about furniture design? For sure. All right. Thank you. I tell stories with stuff. That's, <laughs> that, that's my job, is I, I support the text. Uh, I work with the actors to help them to build their characters and give them the physical tools that they need to be the people that they want to be in that play. Mm. And then I add visual texture to the set and the surroundings. So I give the director what they need to tell the story and I make it look like the designer wants it to look. Uh, but maybe most importantly, I, I give the actors the tools that they need to be the characters that they need to be. Which, as I experienced, is literally millions of different things. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. Cool. I have a lot of stuff to tell stories with. <laughs> yeah. I'm very fortunate cool. that. Yeah. Right. Or you yeah. make the right. stuff if you don't have it. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, Go ahead. I'll, I'll say for myself, I, I do a lot of different things, and many of them are, are somewhat new um, to, my, to my journey and my path. Um, but I found the last five years um, that once I found, I found a very strong passion for for doing things that are right and not being afraid to use my voice um, no matter what. And I found that once I spoke my truth and spoke the truth of what I saw, um, that there were others who either believed in what I believed in, wanted to help change the narrative, or just supported someone else who had a strong passion. And from there came other opportunities. So I was, I was willing to not um, just do what most actors do, just go towards the work, just, you know, I just want to work, I just want to work. It was bigger than that. It was I wanted to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, and I was able to find the art in everything and everyone around me. And that's led yeah. to directing and writing a piece this yeah. year that's being produced in the spring in Madison. And, um, and then also acting in all kinds of productions and TV and film that I did not have prior to me Mm -hmm. Prior to me not being afraid, mm -hmm. being afraid to opening my mm -hmm. voice. True. Right. Because yeah. seeking the truth is what it's all about, yeah. right? Yeah. That you, and I think that's what I try to do in every, in, find what the truth is in a particular piece and then reflect that through my own prism, you know, of creativity to the best that I can do. Mm -hmm. So, Absolutely. yeah. So we live kind of like in a moment where Truth seems mercurial, it's a very distracted time, an overstimulated over time, um, kind of a screen addicted time too. So mm -hmm. very quickly, uh, I want you guys to make an argument to your average Milwaukee out there watching this of why they should care about what you do. Why is it that they should come to whatever you do and <laughs> spend some money and time <laughs> witnessing it? Uh, theater, I love Netflix and I love the movies but they're exactly the same whether I watch them or not. And mm -hmm. theater is always different. And it's different because you're there. And you can come the next night and be there and it will be different. Mm. And that makes it a special thing and that is unique in the, in the art world. Alice Walker, who's one of my favorite writers, said that art is the mirror in which we see our collective soul. And I think we need more and more ways to be a collective instead of the myriad of ways mm. where we can be divided. Mm. We bring ideas to life. Mm -hmm. I mean, live, right yeah. there in front of you, walking around, and yeah. it, it's, it sounds a little artsy-fartsy, but theater's a living thing. Like, exactly like you said, it's yeah. never the same twice in a row. Somebody has a cold, somebody got mm -hmm. a parking mm -hmm. ticket, the audience mm -hmm. got there late. It, it changes mm -hmm. everything that somebody happens a on stage. Moment yeah. That they didn't know was going to happen. 
Yeah. You know, right. that guy's cell phone goes off and 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 it completely changes what's going on on yeah. stage. Mm -hmm. You can you don't get there yeah. right. anywhere else. And that's the beauty of all of our arts is that they remind us that our bodies have an intelligence. Mm -hmm. That our intuitions, our unconscious, our subconscious are motivating us. They're motivating our work and that we don't control that. We just have to be open to the things that come our way, try to absorb them, try to manifest whether it's truth or whether it's not truth, I don't know, somewhere in between, you know, that we have the ability to control meaning through the things that we make. Mm -hmm. And I, I tell you, life is never boring once you realize mm -hmm. that. Because you look at the world and you see the meaning in it and all the depth of layers that a single object can convey. And um, I don't know, it's very, it's very powerful. And maybe that's less of a societal lesson than a, than a lesson for people to understand what art and design can bring to their own lives uh, in a personally meaningful way. Absolutely, and, and theater, um, the field that, uh, that, I'm, that I'm in, um, is, is one of the most unfiltered, I feel, um, mm -hmm. forms of art when it comes to telling stories. Television, there's executives, there's studios, there's producers, mm -hmm. co-producers, directors, there's all kinds of filters um, and manipulation going on. And in Milwaukee or your local town, um, it's that small committee picking that story fit for your community. And so um, it's for you. Mm -hmm. It's for you, not the millions of people around the, around the world, but for you, and that's special. And you're an active participant. Yes. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. Right. So before we started, Eric was saying to me the time constraint that I was putting on everyone to be really short. I, I was like, you're the, the man. man. <laughs> you're the man. <laughs> and I was kind of wondering, like, I'm the man. Can the conversation get anywhere? And I think you guys yeah. brought somewhere really beautiful. Good. Thank you all yeah. for Thank sharing. You. And we're going to go now into a performance. Uh, yep, we're going to go right into the performance <laughs> Thank you. with present music. I want to make sure the, the ship's moving forward. Uh, we have present music here. They're going to be playing uh, It's Benjamin Dameron and Eric Segnitz from present music. And they're going to be playing Roulette by composer Dan right. Truman. That's great piece. And uh, yeah. let's let them take it away.
So once again, that's present music. Eric and Benjamin, thank you so much. Another round of applause. I want to thank all of our guests uh, who are with us tonight, Nancy and Al from the Racine Symphony Orchestra, Susan Fate, Jim Guy, Eric Vogel, and Malkia Stampley. Um, and also Present Music has their Thanksgiving concert coming up on November 17th, so you can look that up online. A huge thanks to the United Performing Arts Fund. Round of applause for them. Also, our production partners, uh, Epic Creative, Radio Milwaukee. Next week, we'll be back at Radio Milwaukee for our last episode on October 30th, Monday. And our last show will be dinner and a movie. So we'll see you at Radio Milwaukee in a week and a half. Thanks a lot. <laughs>